Okay, this is Dennis Gill with the Americans in Wartime Museum. Today's date is 10 April 2021. And I have the pleasure of interviewing Gerald Racy. We are here at the VFW Hall in Edinburgh, Virginia. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Things okay. like that. Okay, I was born five miles from here in Woodstock, Virginia. Okay. Born and raised there. My whole family uh, was born and raised there, uh, except for my, my parents. They were born elsewhere. I have uh, uh, five siblings, one of which is deceased, passed away last year. My older brother, Carol, he was in uh, Korea, post-war Korea. And I have uh, three sisters, two of them are older than I, one is younger. Um, one lives in California, one lives in uh, Virginia Beach area now, and the other one lives here in Woodstock, uh, so they're pretty close. And then another brother, the younger brother, lives in uh, Myrtle Beach. Okay. So, And uh, like I said, I was born and raised in Woodstock, I lived here all my life except when I was in the service. and. I uh, lived for a short period of time in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, that was a shock, sure <laughs> culture shock I'm and everything. Sure um, I did spend a year in South America, in Peru, uh, working there. And I also, uh, it, of course, my Vietnam tour, different locations in uh, the United States, plus Vietnam, the Republic of Vietnam. Yeah. What, uh, other than your brother, you say your brother was in the service? Yes. Any other family members that served? Yes, my younger brother was in the service, and okay. his ex-wife was in the service. Okay. My sister was in the Navy. Uh, she was a Navy nurse. Okay. Uh, so the, those were the, the ones of my immediate family. Okay. I had uh, one, two, three, four uncles and an aunt who all served in the, uh, in the Army or the Air Force, and my aunt was in... I don't know what they called them back then, but you know, she was in the army, whatever they had for the for the the women. It was in the army wax? Is that yeah, what they called? Yeah, something I think like that. that's what they were called. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. Okay. So, and that was all during World War II, okay. and uh, so they all were service members, of course. Right. Very you, proud of that. And you served in the army. Yes. I was what year did you join the army? I, I joined in. I got a cheat sheet. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, enlisted in Dece on December 4th of 1965, right. uh, pretty much out of high school. I graduated from high school in 64. Okay. I was about ready to be drafted, and I knew that was coming. Right. And, um, so you joined the Army to, before you got drafted? Yeah. You got a little bit of control? Yeah, I had some control. Um, okay. I had a recruiter friend who lived in Harrisonburg, and he stopped by the house, and we started talking. Of course, I knew my number was coming. and So he... Uh, he was talking with my parents and me, and he says, well, have you ever thought about flying? And I said, well, who hasn't, you know? Right. He says, well, would you rather walk in Vietnam or would you rather fly? And I said, well, that's an easy answer, too. Right. So that's how I got into flight school. He says, well, let's do the battery tests and see if you can get in flight school and fly helicopters. So that's how that started, and uh, we pursued it, uh, pursued that, uh, did the... Uh, the, the testing in right. Roanoke and the physical stuff in in uh, Fort Eustace. Uh, and interesting story. I def after I, there was one other person, a boy from Harrisonburg, uh, Gary Hinkle, and I went to test together. He this was this was his second attempt, okay. and my first. And I didn't know anything about flying, so I went through the battery of tests. And we were sitting in the room, and they were <clears throat> reading the results. And they went down through the names and said who passed and who failed. So Gary passed. He got to me, and I failed. And my recruiter was standing behind him. And uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but he says, I got something to tell you, but not until after you finish flight school. Okay, so... <laughs> With the basic and flight school and all that, and I came back and we got together here in, in uh, Harrisonburg, having a few drinks. And he says, "You remember when they said you failed?" I said, "Yeah." He says, "I took the paper and changed your grade, <laughs> changed a seven to an eight or whatever it was." And he says, "That's how you got in," because <laughs> he he had done that. And I remember him taking the paper and handing it back to the captain. He says, "This one passed." <laughs> and he had changed the grade on it. So anyway, 
That's how leave I got, it to the recruiter. Yeah, right? leave it to the recruiter. <laughs> right. Oh, they'll do whatever. Yes, they will. <laughs> so anyway, I got through flight school, and you know, and no, <laughs> no problem. So he was proud of the fact that <laughs> right. that that I'd made it. <laughs> right. And I was surprised. That so you he, had never flown before. Never though. had nothing. Never been off the ground. Right. So. Right. So tell us a little bit about flight school. What's that like? Oh, it's, especially for somebody who's brand new to flying. Well, it's 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 a it's a very very intensive training and. You start out, uh, we went to Fort Walters, Texas, and when you start out in the pre-flight thing where the senior uh, uh, students there are harassing you all the time. They, the, the, the new guys, they, they just are all over them, constantly harassing, right. trying to break, you know, break the, uh, the uh, candidates by you know, getting in your face and yell at them, make you do push-ups and all that kind of stuff. So it was, uh, uh, the pre-flight status was like, you know the period where they tried to break as many students as they could to make sure that you know that they could take the pressure of, of the later training and so forth and what you might run into in, in uh, combat so yeah i went through basic training at fort walters and uh, flew oh 23s for my the, the helicopter for the um, basic primary training and uh, in Texas, in the hot days, there would be the instructor and two students in that helicopter. Mm -hmm. And it was so hot, the helicopter could not hover. Right. You couldn't pick it up off the ground. So we ground taxi. We actually drove the helicopter on the skids out to the takeoff place. And then when we make our takeoffs, when it was really hot, and just by start, slide that aircraft forward until it reached uh, enough airspeed that right. it went through what's called translational lift gives you added lift and the helicopter would take off and okay. fly. Okay. So that was the basic training. I went through that and had no problem at all. So loaded, I don't know, maybe, I don't remember, maybe 16, 17 hours, something like that. And um, back then when you soloed, you had to do touchdown auto rotations mm -hmm. without the, you know, without the instructor in there. And then of course you soloed, you flew around the pattern. So you soloed first, and then later on he'd, you'd have to go out and do touchdown all the rotations with a helicopter without the instructor in. Later on they changed that. I guess they meant too many helicopters, and and they didn't have to do the touchdown all the rotations. But right. that was no problem. Do, then, do you learn so real quick before you get off of this? Do, do you learn any fixed wing? No, for no but so it? much of it is you know transfers. The right. aerodynamics is. Uh, you know, uh, of the of the rotor blade wing is a wing. It right. just rotates. It's almost identical to the airplane. Okay. So the aerodynamics part of it, and and the navigation and all that kind of stuff is pretty much the same. The, the biggest difference is what it takes to manipulate the aircraft to hover it and right. so forth, right. and to take off and land. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So finished uh, that, and then. When they transferred me to Fort Rucker to start the uh, uh, the transition into the Hueys and the advanced training, uh, the school was already filled up, so they held me over and checked me out in a 44 passenger bus, and I drove st <laughs> students around for a month or whatever it was until they had an opening for me at Rucker. So I went to Rucker and um, transitioned. Well, we went through. Uh, the uh, instrument training first in the Bell OH-13, mm -hmm. and that was equipped with instruments so we could learn how to fly under the hood and so forth in instrument uh, right. conditions. Uh, they did not give us a full instrument ticket. They gave us a, a tactical instrument ticket, which was enough information to get you out of a cloud if you went into it, you know, hopefully. Right. And, you know, make approaches, uh, you know, with either radar guidance or or whatever navigation aid you had. Right. So it wasn't a full instrument ticket, but it was enough for me, and I wasn't very good at it anyway, and I, I, I would get a little bit nauseous under the hood on a hot summer day, and, right. and but uh, I made it through it. And the instructor says, well, after we finished, he said, well, you passed. He says, but you never make a real good instrument <laughs> pilot. I said, well, I agree with you that with that so after that then we transitioned went through transition into the huey uh1s okay and uh and that training i don't remember how long it was maybe maybe a month and a half something like that where we learned to fly the, fly the huey and then after that uh we did our tactical training in the huey where we'd go out and practice combat assaults you know the whole air mobile uh situation right and fly a formation and 
night flying cross country and all that type of thing. Did you have the, so once you pass initial flight school, mm -hmm. do you have the option of, of what uh, aircraft you want to fly or they, they pretty much no, tell you? they just tell you where you're going. Uh, um, you know, I would have liked to have been gone to guns, but they put me in slicks, which okay. which is the troop carriers. But you know, so I flew slicks the whole time I was in Vietnam. Okay. The only time I flew guns is when I could beg a ride, you know, right. and go up with them, get to shoot the guns once in a while. But right. but I never never actually flew any missions that uh, where I was aircraft commander or right. anything like that. How, how long? <clears throat> so you, so day one in flight school until you're ready to fly in country. How long before they, they give you the permission? Okay, you're good. Uh, well, what happened with me, instead of sending me directly to Vietnam after I finished flight school, is they sent me to Fort Cam Campbell, Kentucky. Okay. And <clears throat> we were forming, they were forming a brand new helicopter company, complete assault helicopter company, the 188th. And it was part of the 101st Airborne. Right. And so we went there for training. And one of the primary reasons was we had brand new helicopters, Hueys, the new H models that had just come out with, mm -hmm. and they had the more horsepower engine. Uh, okay. They had a 200 horsepower more than the previous engine. Okay. It was an L13 engine compared to the L9, like homie. Uh, and, the, and the engines hadn't been proven yet. So we had six aircraft, if I remember right, it's either three or six, that we flew almost continuously. Okay. And to build as many hours as fast as we could, and they fly them for an hour, a couple of hundred hours, ground the aircraft, tear the engine apart. The, the people would, you know, from Lacombe would be there. They tear it down, look at it, inspect it, put it back together, send it back out flying. So they were trying to build hours to prove the engine's reliability. Okay. So that's what we did, and as well as our normal training as a unit before we went to Vietnam. So I was right. Fort Campbell, I think, for four months in right. our training. But, but once you once you graduated flight school, you were checked out to go. You yeah. could have gone. Yeah, I could have gone directly from there. Okay. How long was that, roughly? How long does that take? Uh, I think, let's see. Um, I, December 66 is when I got my wings, so that's when I finished. Okay. So it was night, night 19, uh, December, of, uh, December 4th, 65. So about a year. About a year. About a year, uh, including basic training. Gotcha. Basic okay. training, I think, is what, three months or four yeah. months, something okay. like that. Okay. So that's about a year from the time I entered the service till I was ready, you know, the, okay. theoretically to go fly. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And, you know. So that's how I got started. And after we finished our training at Fort uh, Campbell, <clears throat> they shipped the whole helicopter company over to Vietnam mm -hmm. as a complete unit. Um, the advanced unit went first with the aircraft and part of the crew, uh, ground people, went on a ship and they set up our basic camp o over there initially and then the rest of the uh, unit flew over in airplanes. Right. So, first assignment in Vietnam was Dao Tiang, and, which is a uh, Michelin rubber plantation. <clears throat> so our tents, we were set up in GP medium tents on wooden elevated platforms, and we right. were in the rubber plantation, so beautiful shade all the time. <laughs> uh, and the place had an elevated, large swimming pool, and, which was part of the Michelin you know, <laughs> right. family. They owned that and so forth. And it had a little runway, very short runway there, and uh, the aircraft were lined up there. So that's where I started my... Okay my overseas tour. What's your initial impressions of Vietnam when you get there? Oh man, hot. <laughs> of course, you step off that airplane and oh my God, you know, the humidity and so forth. And right. I got there in April of, uh, of uh, 67 and yeah, it was very hot and I flew into, uh, I think we flew into Tonsonut and then they transferred us over to Benoit and then I put got on a caribou and flew on a caribou up to Dao Chiang. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know, other than just being hot, you know, a new guy and scared, you know, shit right. the shit that's in because of right. being in, in a war zone and so forth. And we didn't know what to expect. We were right. new guys, but 
we were young and invincible. So, yeah. <laughs> so tell us about your first your first flight in country. Oh, that was really, that was really funny. My first flight, we didn't we were a brand new company, so we didn't have but a few uh, pilots that had any previous flight experience in Vietnam. Uh, okay. There were maybe ten in the whole company. And so we were sent out with, uh, you know, brand new guys, right. no aircraft commander assigned yet. So we would switch back and forth. I'd be an aircraft commander one day, and then the guy I was flying with it would be the you know, co-pilot. Next day, he'd be the aircraft commander. And we did that for about a month until I was uh, assigned the aircraft commander. But my first flight out, they gave us a map, gave us the coordinates. So... He was flying and I was navigating and I took him 180 degrees in the wrong direction and we flew and we're heading towards Cambodia and, and you know, after we'd flown a while, I said, this isn't right. So we called the people on the ground and, and um, he got a kind of a dead general direction of where they were and turned around and we eventually found the place. I never made that mistake again, but, uh, you know. Uh, stupid but anyway yeah that was my first flight and it was an ash and trash mission which is just a resupply thing i don't okay. know what we carried people or i don't remember ammo who knows you know water food you just right. don't know but anyway that's that you know the first most of the first missions were that type ash and trash or uh, command and control that type right. of thing uh uh, but it wasn't with, you know, more than a couple of weeks that we started doing combat assaults and, you know, from formation flying with groups of anywhere from three to 20 helicopters, uh, inserting either American troops or uh, uh, Vietnamese soldiers. Right. And uh, so we did that for a while. So tell, tell <coughs> and, us about that, your first time. What? The, the first time that you combat did assault? You, combat assault. Oh, right. I don't know. You're you're so busy flying. You you just you know you're right. If it's twenty aircraft, you're flying whatever formation the leader calls, and and he does all the navigating, and you just fly off the aircraft beside you that you're, and you just try to maintain position and try to keep it fairly tight and snug. So, so when you do a combat assault, you try to have the whole flight of however many there are touch down at the same time. And then, that, so you ex, you limit the exposure time of the right. aircraft to ground fire and so forth, and and the and the uh, grunts that are on board. And I say that with, you know, that they 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 don't get offensive and when you call yeah. them a grunt. They they, you know, they're actually proud of it. Everyone right. I've ever met. But anyway, you try to land all at the same time so that they can get off the aircraft and exit the aircraft, and have a minimum amount of exposure to ground fire, and then so that when the last guy in, in formation, he'll say, you know, you know, chalk 10 or whatever the number is, we're up, which means he's telling the guy that's leading it, take off. And right. so, so that's kind of what it is. Uh, and the guy that's leading it, he's reading the map. And if we're, usually they'll have gunships prepping the LZ, uh, they'll go in and shoot it up on both sides of where we're landing. Right. while we're doing the approach so there's rockets and machine guns and stuff going off many times right beside you the gunships right. that would be right beside you the, so you know unless you were getting shot at it's it's tense and it's you know you're trying to find a place to land you're trying to stay in formation and get the aircraft down and get your uh your troops off safely mm -hmm. and then get back out of there as quickly as possible uh, so that, that's basically it and that and then you you may or may not go back and get them the same day. If they get into contact, um, then we may go in and resupply and mm -hmm. take out the wounded. So it all depends on what happens once, yeah. once they're in there. If it gets real bad, sometimes we have to take them out, you know, to, to get them out of harm's way. And that's usually pretty hot, you know. Right. It's usually a lot of shooting and, you know, aircraft shot down sometimes or people wounded or killed even right. on the aircraft. Do you have a gunner on your aircraft? Yeah, you have a crew chief and a door gunner on the. Okay, so there's four crew members. Yes, yeah, four crew members: the pilot, co-pilot, the aircraft commander, and then the, the co-pilot and okay. the crew chief and door gunner. And those crew chief and door gunners pretty much stay with their same their aircraft. Right. And in the units I was in, the pilots pretty much stay with the same aircraft. Not the co-pilots, but the aircraft commander did. Okay. And then the co-pilots would kind of, you know, jump around. So you may have been in different 
chopper every day. Uh, yeah, yeah, Cook, but, in theory. but but in theory, but yeah. most of the time I flew my the same okay. aircraft. Okay. Uh, I'd say eighty percent of the time I was in the same aircraft, which right. is good. You get to learn the aircraft, yeah. and its capabilities and so forth. But uh, any. Uh, did you ever experience any enemy fire? Oh yeah, or, yeah. It, anybody that did any of that in Vietnam got got shot up. Right. I got shot up. I have no idea how many times. I don't right. remember how many bullet holes. Uh, frequently, yeah, at least, probably the aircraft took rounds at least once a week. Sometimes it would go two weeks before the aircraft got hit. Um, but I never was shot down because the aircraft, although it took rounds, it was still flyable. And I always made it back to a secure area, so I never counted it. Right. But I have landed at a secure area and got out and said, oh, my God, why am I still flying this thing? Because right. oil leaking out of it and stuff like that. But it was still flying. So, right. you know. so there were times that I came back and landed and got in another aircraft and continued to do the same job uh, right. because mine was shot up so badly. Uh, had numerous... Crew chiefs and door gunners wounded. Uh, none of them were ever very serious. And one, one door gunner got shot twice with one round and went through his arm, came out and went through his wow. thing up here. Uh, but you know, it was it still wasn't really severe as far as that kind of wound. Um, I think, I think in one day I went through. Two or three crew chiefs and door gunners that got wounded, mm. and you know, had to be replaced. So they couldn't continue to work. So it got so that sometimes that day nobody wanted to fly with me. But uh, <laughs> right. but you know, but no, I never. I was never touched. I, mean, I had some funny things happen with my crew chief. Got shot one time, and we were at fairly high altitude. And I heard, and he came on the intercom, says, "I'm I'm hit. I'm hit." And, and I turned around and looked at him. I said, where are you hit? And he held his foot up in his boot. He had the combat boots on. And he took a round and it spin itself right in the, in the leather sole wow. and stuck there. It bruised the heck out of his toe, but didn't draw blood. Yeah. <laughs> he was laughing. He wow. says, in my toe, look at this. <laughs> yeah. but the things like that that wow. happen just, you know, they're funny when you look yeah, back on them. you look back at it. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's pretty serious right. when it happens. What kind of tempo did you guys have? Were you flying every single day, or was there any downtime? We had, we were limited in the number of hours, flight hours you could fly in a 30-day period. Okay. Don't ask me exactly how many, because I don't remember. All I know is that in one year's time in Vietnam, I flew almost, thir well, right at 1,300 hours. And the reason I flew so much is we had these brand new helicopters with this big, powerful engine, and everybody wanted us. All the units wanted us because okay. we could carry extra people, and we could work at higher altitudes. Right. So they they worked us really hard. Uh, not too many people in Vietnam in one year period flew thirteen hundred hours of of uh, right. and most of that's you know combat time. So, right. Um, we after being in in the country for about two months, they took the whole company. And transferred it up to Tuiwa, which is in the two core area. We were stationed initially in the three core, and it took us up to Tuiwa. And the reason being, they wanted us to work with the Korean units up there, the White Horse Division and mm -hmm. the Tiger Division, because they were working in the in the mountains, and it would put that engine, that more powerful engine, to test and utilize it better. So we went up right. there and worked with the Korea uh, Koreans and the super soldiers. Had nothing but good to say about them. They were just tough as nails. And, uh, uh, but I, I have a really sad story to tell while I was there. And the sadness is the reason this happened. <clears throat> I was flying, uh, I got to be pretty close friends with this particular captain, Korean captain, mm -hmm. and they had found some cave uh, situation and it was filled with sewing machines and stuff like that to make clothing and repair clothing and they wanted the sewing machines. <clears throat> so the Koreans were in these caves pulling these sewing machines out. So we had to go hover and drop a rope down over the jungle and they'd tie on a sewing machine or two and we'd hover up out of there and fly it back and set it down back at their base and 
Then we come back and, well, on the third trip in, this Korean captain that always flew in the jump seat, which is your pilot, co-pilot sit here, and he's sitting right here between you, but just a little behind you. So he was literally leaning over talking to me, and we were in the third trip in there, and they were tying on sewing machines, and bap, 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 rounds came up through the belly of the helicopter, went through his leg, came out, went under his rib cage into his heart. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, we cut the, the rope and took him to the hospital, but he didn't survive. And such a waste, just for some sewing right. machines, and it just, that really affected me. Still does. Mm -hmm. Such a waste. But, any, you know, that's war, that stuff happens. But. So we went, we worked with the Koreans uh, for about two and a half months, and then they transferred us all back down to Daotiang. <clears throat> and we flew combat assaults and stuff out of there. And while we, while we were there, Charlie attacked us, uh, and they, we had, our CO had had all the revetments lined up on each side of the runway, just nice and neat up and down each side of the runway. Charlie got set up their mortars off the end of the runway, a quarter of a mile out of town or whatever it was, and started walking mortar rounds up there along the runway. And, just did a number on our aircraft. Just, mm. I think we lost maybe total five or six aircraft direct hits or very close to direct hits. And uh, and a whole lot of them were grounded because of shrapnel and so forth. So uh, our CO got relieved because of that. And so then they dispersed the aircraft all over the compound, built revetments all around, you know. Right so that they weren't lined up like that. You know, I have my, I don't know why they, I guess they wanted to make an example of him, but the other unit that I was in later on, those revetments were lined up, you know, in one particular place and yeah. pretty much in a line, just like they were at that, at that runway. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was pretty, that was a nasty day, night actually. So after six months, because we went over as, as a complete unit, they had to get about half of the pilots out of the unit and bring an equal number back into the unit. Otherwise, everybody would de roast back to the United States right. at the same date. Same time. So <clears throat> they transferred me to a unit over at Phuc Vinh, which is, uh, Dao Tang was about all 35, 40 miles northwest of Saigon. Phuc Vinh was just about due north, a little bit northeast mm -hmm. of Saigon. So I went over there and they put, they didn't have H models, they had the L9 engines, so I had to get back tuned to flying something with a little less power. But it was no big deal. So I went over there and was an aircraft commander. I, I go a step back. I made aircraft commander after about a month and a half in country. And, and uh, so they had to get a bunch of aircraft commanders out there, you know. Right. So, so from then on, I was an aircraft commander. At, at the new unit, they our barracks were chicken houses that were converted to living quarters, and uh, and everything was already set up there, so right. it wasn't bad situation as far as a living situation. Yeah. Still did the same type of thing for the rest of my tour: uh, combat assaults and ash and trash, and flare missions uh, at night. Uh, did a good bit of flare work up when we were in Tuiwa. They did a lot of uh, lighting up the areas out there for the Koreans when they get in, got in contact. They send the aircraft out at night right. and drop flares for them. Okay. And, uh, I did everything you do with a Huey, with a helicopter in Vietnam that I know of, except fly gunships. So, you know, we did McGuire rig, uh, long range reconnaissance patrol. I think I was in Cambodia a couple times. I just don't remember exactly because we were very close to the Cambodian yeah. border. You know, Dao Tiang wasn't far away. And we were always heading that direction and doing combat assaults or long range reconnaissance. Right. Yeah. How, how many, did you do one or more tours in Vietnam? What's that? How one. many tours? Just one. Just one. Yeah, yeah. one year. Okay. Yep. Is there anything that um, stands out, good or bad? About that tour, any any one well, mission or instance? Well, I was there for the for the Tet Offensive, okay. and um, 
you know, all over, all over the news, you know, they said, oh, the U.S. Army and everybody, the whole group over there, it was all a big surprise. They weren't prepared, didn't know it was coming. Right. That's BS. Our whole unit before Tet pulled up from Phuc Vinh and flew the aircraft down to Bung Tao mm -hmm. that night. And because uh, we knew, everybody knew stuff was coming. They didn't know how big it was going to be, but they yeah. expected uh, so we were flying back about three, three o'clock, three thirty in the morning, and we, were, of course, we were listening to the radio and listening to all the chatter and stuff that's going on. When we were flying by the Benoit Air Base, uh, talking to the tower, listening and talking to the tower, and he was giving us a blow-by-blow -blow description of what was going on to the ground. And they were in the process of, of uh, the sappers were getting through the wire and blowing things up. And we were about, oh, maybe two miles from the runway or so, you know, th 3.30 in the morning, and they blew, started blowing the ammo dump. And that was the biggest fireworks display you ever heard, saw in your life. And then, you know, boom, it was just unbelievable when that, all that artillery and ammo started going. So, of course, we were talking to the, the tower operator, and he was telling us what was going on, and he says, i got to close down the tower. He says, Charlie's coming across the runway. I'm leaving. <laughs> so he was out of the tower. And <laughs> so it was quite interesting. And, of course, the Tet Offensive, you know, we were very, very busy before and after uh, combat assaults constantly and extracting wounded and whatever they needed us to do. Right. Did a lot of... Uh, did a lot of... Uh, medevacs, but every helicopter pilot in Vietnam did medevacs, including the gunships. Mm -hmm. There were there were times when people needed to be extracted and the gunships would go in and if they had room and, had, and could get back out, they'd go in and even get uh, wounded and right. carry them out. Right. Uh, As you know, Vietnam was not a popular war back in the United States. Oh no! Oh my God! No. What, was there? Did, were you guys aware of what was going on here? What the public sentiment was here? Somewhat. Uh, did it have any bearing at all on what you're doing? We really didn't think about it too much. Yeah. You know, you just went out and did your job. Uh, you're, you're a soldier. You're trained to do your job, and you tried to do it the best of your ability every day. And right. uh, and we, we were very well briefed on what to expect when we got back. Mm -hmm. I came in through San Diego, and it wasn't pleasant at all. And of course, we were in uh, civilian clothes. They asked us to wear civilian clothes coming through. But, you know, all the protesters were there, and they knew who we were and where right. we were coming from, and they were spitting and cussing and all that kind of stuff, and we just had to grin and bear it. Right. But it, it was not pleasant at all. And, and of course, that, that leaves a, you're pretty bitter at it going through that, you know, mm -hmm. after spending a year, and, you know, in a situation like we were in. So, and so many of your friends, you know, died. I, I witnessed, I didn't witness the, I, we had gunships that flew together in the air, mid-air collision, and everybody died on that. Uh, and that was a night mission. Of course, that was pretty devastating, you know, eight crew members, all of them mm -hmm. perished. And then we were also, at Phuc Vinh, we were attacked mortars and, and uh, rockets one night, and they, they launched the guns, you know, any time they got, got a mortar attack or rocket attack. And we were out sitting on the bunker watching the guns making runs and so forth. And one of the gunships blew up in midair, and it was just, you know, of course, everybody died from that. And we later found out that it actually got hit by our friendly fire, our, mm -hmm. our own il artillery actually hit the aircraft. And right. So that's pretty bad. And, you know, and I lost quite a few friends crashes or shot so uh, so when you come back and you right. have to face what what we faced it wasn't pleasant and I didn't talk about Viet much Vietnam much after I got back uh, it took a while unless it was you know another soldier yeah but to uh, the civilians for the most part no. not even my family too yeah. much yeah. When you flew night missions, were you using were you on instruments or, or night no, vision or no? That was before night vision. Okay. Uh, and instruments only if you got into trouble. It was strictly BFR okay. night flying. Uh, but you know it could get especially if it started raining or something. Sometimes you had to go on instruments. Right. About the only time we actually used instruments that personally is we would do combat assaults and have to take off through the fog. 
early in the morning and sometimes still dark. And uh, we'd send off one ship at a time and they would take off and fly instruments, climb out through the clouds until they got up on top. And we did that one ship at a time until we all got on top of the fog layer right. and then we would join up as a unit and go fly our missions. Now we didn't do ash and trash like that, you know, resupply stuff, but combat assaults we did. If we were going somewhere to pick somebody up, you know, we get up there and join up and we fly wherever we're going. And we usually had, you know, weather reports of where we're going to yeah. where we knew we could get back down through. But that's the only time I ever actually uh, went on instruments knowingly, you know, in, in, in advance knowing that we were going to mm -hmm. do it. A couple of times got out there and rained stuff at night and had to use the instruments a little bit. I did have a, uh, one night after I was doing a, flare mission it was coming back and got started getting smoke in the cockpit and I had to go on instruments a little bit until we figured out where the smoke was coming from and it turned out it was one of the windshield wiper motors that sits inside there we were using them and started smoking right turned that off and vented as well as we could but for a little, short period of time I was on instruments then but, but yeah, that's that's the only times really for me anyway. Yeah. But I know some of the other units over there flew instruments uh, a lot more than I did. Yeah. <clears throat> um, did you have any downtime, any time for recreation or anything? Yeah. yeah, not a whole lot. But you know, you only flew so you could only fly so many hours in a. I think it was a thirty-day period. Right. Once you reached that, those hours, they grounded you for a day or two until you could pick up and have available hours to fly again as, as the days went on. Uh, but sometimes they didn't pay too much attention to those hours and we just overflew them. And of course, as a pilot, you, you know, you're just a young guy, you could do it. So, right. Right. <laughs> so you know, you knew you were tired, but you could still do the job. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. How long did you serve in the Army? Four years, four, four years. year commitment. Yeah. Okay. So you never went back, back to Vietnam after that first? No, no. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, at the time I, my time was about up, then they didn't need all these pilots and they started rifting us. Right. So I was offered a, like a two or three month early out, but I, I said, well, I'd rather not take it if I don't have to. And so I stayed into my full tour. And, right. But uh, and in order to stay in, I could have, but they wanted my wife and kids and all that, you know, I had to commit so much. I said, right. oh, no, right. I didn't have any wife or kids at that time. But, <laughs> but they wanted everything, and I don't think I'm going to sign up. Because I, it absolutely would have been another tour in Vietnam, right. and I figured I was lucky to get through without a scratch. So right. I press your luck. Yeah, I'm going to press my luck. <laughs> yeah. how you, you look back on it now, how did that, how did your combat experience, how's that affected your life? Well, God. I mean, I, we saw so much death. I saw so much that I took took a, uh, the U.S. ambassador and and somebody else. I don't remember some other high-ranking general or something into a mountain yard uh, village that had been destroyed by Viet Cong or uh, NVA. And you know, these because they these units were, these uh, civilians were helping the American soldiers. The NVA did, took no mercy on them. So they went into this village at night and just, you know, all these, uh, you know, these indigenous people were in their holes that they had, hiding places they had, and, and they just torched them with, with uh, threw hand grenades in, and then they used flamethrowers. And, and of course, when I took the ambassador and whoever that general was in there, we shut down and spent a couple of hours, and they had photographers and so forth. And, pictures and it was just you know you know human bodies when they're burned like that it's just awful yeah. to see and I, I don't remember how many maybe 20 25 were lined up there you know all deceased and you know it, every day well not every day but any time that the soldiers got into uh, you know a hot LZ and, and got into combat firefight it was invariably wounded and, and frequently, you know, KIA. So we had to go in and, and extract them, and uh, you know, a lot of blood and and that, and body bags and so forth. So you, you dealt with that pretty much on a weekly 
basis. You would have to deal with that. It hardened me to uh, to death, you know, because I saw so much of it and and wounds and so forth. So I think it toughened me in that respect. Um, but I didn't, as far as I know, I didn't have any PTSD from it. Or, you know, most of us, when you come back, you you don't sleep well because you hear these mm -hmm. noises outside of backfire and automobile or fireworks. And for a while, you roll out of bed and pull the mattress on top of you, things like that. But I, most everybody that was in Vietnam, you know, suffered that for a while when they got back until they got over that, realized they're back in the world. So. Right. I, I don't know. I, you'd almost have to ask somebody you know that knew me before and after to right. you know how much. You know, obviously it changes everybody. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't know. Other than the bitterness of having to deal with you know the anti-war people, that's that's about the only thing that was really a negative. You know, I I was all in to doing their job over there while we were there, and right. uh, I believed in it. And, to a certain extent, I think I still do. If the politicians would stay the hell out of it and let the, you know, yeah. let the military do what they do best, and that seems to be the problem in every war. Yeah, yeah, yeah unfortunately. Yeah. So our mission here is to capture, record, record and <laughs> capture these stories, stories mm -hmm. like yours. Mm -hmm. Hopefully somebody in 50 or 100 years might watch this. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> My kids will probably right. want, to, want to watch it. Is there a message it, yeah. you want to send somebody? Yeah. Oh, about your service? About your I don't know. You know, I, I re I'm very proud that uh, that I served and that I went to Vietnam. I'm proud of the fact that I did. Unlike most people, I actually got a complete career out of flying. I didn't retire from flying until a year and a half ago. Oh, well, it'll be two years in August. Mm -hmm. So my flying experience became a career and I've flown pretty much ever since uh, commercially. Uh, doing, mostly it's been spray operations and mm -hmm. firefighting with helicopter. Um, initially it was flight instruction I was teaching students, civilians, and uh, doing charter work around New York City, all over the Northeast. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, I tell anybody, you know, if they're interested in the service, uh, go for it. And, you know, I would have made a career out of it if the situation had been different. Yeah. I mean, we have pilots here who made a career, of, you know, in this, in this organization. Uh, and he stayed in and retired from it. So that'd be my message, you know, if, you, if you're if you interested in the military, it's not for everybody, there's no doubt about that, and it's changed a lot. I mean, I talk to people that are active now in the reserves and stuff, and when I was there, you know, it was pretty cut and dried. You did this and you did that, and you obeyed the rules. Now those rules have bent so much and been softened so much from what I hear, I wouldn't even recognize the uh, the service now, as far as you know, the chain of command and the regulations and so forth that people have to put that put up with now. Yeah. And it's a, it reflect it's a reflection of the, I think, of the liberal situation that the, the country is in now. Yeah, uh, that's my opinion. So yeah. probably accurate. Yeah. That's about it, you know. I do not regret a minute of it. I wish that there hadn't been so much death and destruction, but I felt that it was my duty at that at that time. And coming from a family who is so strongly military, my father didn't serve, but he already had uh, children, and he had three brothers and a and a sister in the service, and he was. Uh, the oldest, so they didn't take him. But he worked in the in the war industry. He helped, helped wire the Mitchell bombers mm -hmm. over in Baltimore, uh, and uh, so he did his part too. So, yeah. Well, sir, on behalf of the Americans of Wartime Museum, thank you for sitting mm -hmm. down and telling us your story, mm -hmm. uh, and thank you most uh, most of all for your service. Well, as you can see. I talk a lot. <laughs> I and uh, I want to say welcome home. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate welcome. it.